We want to welcome every one of you to our consultation or program review consultation. Before we get into any other thing, we want to uh, pray at this time. I want to ask one of our school officers in the person of Mrs. Galen Joseph Carr to open us in prayer. Pleasant day to everyone. Um, are you all hearing me? As we come together to fulfill your work, I pray that you will take the lead in this discussion. Continue to be with us as we work towards enhancing our programs to meet the needs of your people. I give you all the praise and glory because without you, this will be impossible, but we know that you will be in a midst with continue to just give you all the praise, give you all the worship, and say thank you in advance. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. Thank you very much, amen. Thank you very much, Sister Carr. She is also our Education Technology Officer in WIS, as well as our librarian. Before we get into the um, my own um, introduction of remarks, we want to welcome all of you today. We want to have this time welcome to our president, um, the Reverend Dr. President Kerr. I just want to come and bring you a remarks and launch us as we proceed into our consultation. Let's welcome you, Reverend Dr. A pleasant good evening to all. And welcome to our program consultation. I am Desmond Bird. The age questions. What is this present age? What does this age require? What does it mean to serve now? These are some of the questions we have to answer. Hopefully, we can get some answers for this afternoon. WIS continues to experience active COVID in this fashion. But notwithstanding growing dilemmas that impose continuous challenges for us and relating realism present evolving prospects, yes, to validate being a witness for Christ at the same time. So that complications should be about growing. And for West, not only West, churches, faith based organizations and their expanse. But God is at work in incisive ways to minister the gospel and authorizing faith based communities towards active spirit led presences within their setting. Yes, Lord. God's kingdom is demonstrated frequently in a way that's only seen after watchful searching. And there is much to learn and ascertain as followers of Christ as we seek to authentically serve amidst in all the multifaceted of realities that confront us. So that the Western School of Theology is indeed an exceptional context for Christ's disciples, but it does not exist in a void. Which does not exist in a void. So the church is a Worldwide unit sustained and, and underwired by strong arrangement of people across homegrown, right, or locally, regionally, and globally. This is the official training institution of PAWI, which is the Pentecostal Assemblies of the West Indies. So, as a part of Christ's body, rooted in PAWI, this invites all stakeholders to participate in urgent discuss during, discuss during our program consultation. So this platform this evening aims to bring together voices from throughout the church to foster meaningful discussions that provoke important questions, stir illuminating dialogue, and explore innovative theological frameworks to equip the church 
for crisis witnesses. So the West Program Consultation is an ongoing operational exercise. It seeks to bring together church, parishes, and ministry leaders of PAWI, members of mission agencies, Christian thinkers, and specialists, individuals engaging in context of Christianity, and anyone with a, a curiosity and concern for issues impacting Christians in their own settings. Ladies and gentlemen, as part of the ongoing effort of WIS to provide authentic training and development for tomorrow's servant leaders, as president, I do welcome you to this very, very important program consultation and may it abound to the honor and glory of God. On behalf of Western School of Theology, welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And it's my pleasure to again welcome all of you. Um, we know that we have persons from different parts of our constituency. We are here in Trinidad, but Trinidad is divided into a number of districts. And uh, I'm sure we have persons who are here from uh, representing those different districts. My name is Warren Harper, and I am the Vice President for Academic Affairs of WIST. And as such, I have the responsibility for overseeing the entire program of the West Indies School of Theology. And this is despite where it is located. We have schools, the main campus is in Maracas, but we also have sites in Barbados. Uh, we have a presence in Tobago. We would have had presence in uh, places like St. Vincent, St. Lucia, Antigua, uh, Dominica, um, different parts. We would have had students over the years from different countries. Currently, we offer a number of programs. And uh, one of the responsibilities that we have is to look deeply at these programs on a periodic basis. We started years ago, uh, we would have offered a program in most persons would have graduated from WIS in the late 80s, in the late 70s, 90s, would have done a 96 credit diploma where they would have studied for three years. During that time, WIS, that was uh, introduced in 1992, WIS introduced a bachelor's of theology. Uh, uh, um, yes, it introduced a bachelor's of theology. And then subsequently, in mid-2000 and around 2009, 2010, WIS would have phased out the diploma and the bachelor's of theology, and it would have developed and would have sought approval for and would have received approval for programs in interdisciplinary studies. We would have had a number of emphases, and the, the next presenter would just touch a little bit on the, that in historical perspective. But we would have had a number of programs now, one of the things is uh, with, with these emphases, we would have we would have also developed uh, programs where we would have been offering um, a focus in Christian ed, pastoral studies, Bible and theology, uh, youth ministry, missions, etc., and counseling and, and psychology. These programs were meant to and are meant to undergo periodic uh, review. And there's a purpose to the review because the, the, the review would give us a sense of how the programs are doing, how well it is serving its stakeholders. It would give us a sense of areas we need to strengthen, what we need to change, what we need to add, what we need to drop as the case may be. Over the years, we would have engaged in varying degrees in this process, but we have, beginning 2021, the then present Dr. Pat Glasgow would have commissioned a comprehensive review of the program. And um, our current president, Dr. Desmond Ferret, would have subsequently uh, reinforced this mandate. And uh, this is, we, we would have launched that in 2021. Uh, we would have begun and we noticed there were certain things that we had to strengthen. And so we spent the next couple of months reviewing our documents and 
uh, establishing some areas to ensure that when we get into the process, it's going to be a strong pro a strong process. We're also uh, experiencing our um, reaccreditation visit. And so at the beginning of this year, we have launched fully into our program review. This program review is going to be guided by a steering committee. And um, the chair of that steering committee is myself as the vice president for academic affairs. Um, in addition to that, the members of the steering committee are the um, our quality assurance officer, the person who's going to be doing the bulk of the presentation, as well as the person who opened in prayer or education technology officer and librarian, Mrs. Galan Joseph Carr. And together with a number of other committees, we're going to be working together to lead the accreditation, but the, uh, the program review. But by leading the program review, this is not a, an activity for WIS Maracas. This is for all of our stakeholders. And so this is going to involve a particular committee called the Program Monitoring and Development Committee, which is a relatively newly formed committee. And this committee will do the heavy lifting of the process of leading and doing the work involved in the program review itself. And we are going to be drawing from different stakeholders, members of the program, uh, they, we call it the PDMC, members of this committee draw from different places. We have persons from Trinidad, we have persons from Barbados, we have from Tobago, we have persons who are faculty, we have persons who are educators, we have persons who are, are um, in different areas, uh, curriculum, to help give us this balance and to help us to represent the views of, of the stakeholders, which is going to be critical to the process. We also have a curriculum review committee. That committee is appointed by the president and the, the program review, the PDMC is appointed by the academic committee of which I'm the chair. And so these committees work separately. These are uh, independent committees, but they work together in that they have specific responsibilities that ensure that the programs follow the process. Today is an important day because it gives us, this is the third meeting that we are having with some of our stakeholders. And um, there will be an additional meetings where we'll be having. We'll also be breaking down into subcommittees from different places, different persons representing these committees that will give us a sense of the needs of our constituency, as well as that will help us with the review and uh, so we will be asking all of you to give us your full support today. Give us your, your, your candid uh, feedback because we are seeking to see how we can strengthen what we're doing so that we can have a school that continues to offer excellent service. We, we serve the churches of the Pentecostal Assemblies of the West Indies. In Trinidad, we serve the churches of the Open Bible Standard Churches. But we also have a number of persons from different churches, some non-denominational, some uh, are Church of God, New Testament. Uh, we have different, in Barbados, we have a, a campus which serves the people of Barbados. We also are serving persons who are in different countries, and we want to continue to serve you all as our constituent. The bulk of this presentation today is going to be led by our quality assurance officer, um, one of the members of the steering committee. And she's going to be leading the discussion. And uh, we also have our, our tech person here with us. And what we want to be able to do is to get questions. We, we will allow for questions. We will allow for your feedback. And uh, so we also allow for questions at certain times, and we really are hoping that we'll have this feeder into the, this process. So we want to thank you for your presence. We are scheduled for a two-hour presentation um, from the beginning, which is when we start at 6.30. So we are looking to be here till about 8.30.
Um, so I want to welcome Ms. Andrea Brasnell, our Quality Assurance Officer at this time, who's going to take it from here and lead us into the, this part of the consultation. Good evening, everybody. Let's say thank God for technology that we are able to be here. I'm seeing that we have 56 persons online. So we are indeed grateful that we will get feedback um, from you as we do go through this process. Um, how I would proceed, just test something here. Right, good. So I will just go through some background information regarding program review and WIST with you. And then we go into a period where we have seven questions that we would like to discuss as fully as possible. We know that we won't get very deep into it, but as Reverend Harper said, we will have other meetings with other groups as we go along. Um, but what we share this evening, what we receive from you this evening will inform those meetings and how we even construct those groups as we proceed. So let me just give you a little background on program review. Reviewing a program is essentially checking to see if it is still fit for purpose. Reverend Harper would have explained a little bit in terms of the history in a very concise way, the history of WIST and its programs, um, where it started with the diploma, then the bachelor's in theology, and now we have the bachelor's in interdisciplinary studies. We have the associate degree, sorry, the diploma, et cetera. So we need to look at those programs to determine if they are still fit for purpose in, with regards to what they were, wanted, they were set out to do. It is also to um, ensure that the programs are out aligned to their aims and objectives. A program, say for instance, the bachelor and uh, with the specialization in pastoral studies, there's a document that has to be prepared called a program specification. And that program specification will have in it the aims and objectives and the outcomes for the program. So at the end, at some specified period, you check do an evaluation to see if you are attaining those aims and objectives. And also to see if it's aligned to the strategic direction of the faculty or university or school in this instance. Um, it would also help us in terms of quality improvement and to demonstrate to our stakeholders, particularly ACTT in this case, that the programs are quality assured and constantly under review so that we are up to with it. WIST has a policy as to how program review is supposed to be done and when it is supposed to be done. According to that policy, program review is supposed to be completed every four years. If the president decides there's an urgent matter and we need to do it a little sooner, then that's possible. Um, the last major program review would have been when the interdisciplinary programs were created, which would have been around 2012, 2013, and there was a partial review in 2016. So essentially, we are overdue for a comprehensive review of the programs, and I think this time is timely, being post-COVID and all the other challenges that educational institutions on a whole are having to face with. The purpose of the review, according to WIS policy, so there are general guidelines that you would find in your textbooks and research papers, but in WIS case, it has said in its policy that program review is to assure continuous enhancement of the quality of its programs, to assure mission centrality of academic programs so that we are still focused on the mission of the institution, and to provide feedback to the board of directors and governors that we are continuously improving and developing the program. So we're not staying stagnant. Further, that said policy states 
that the objectives of the review are to identify the strengths and weaknesses of academic and academic support programs. So not just the teaching aspect of it, but those things that support the teaching aspect. So like your library, um, student affairs, we would also look at the strengths and weaknesses of those. The adequacy of institutional support, whether the program is meeting the expectation of our internal and external constituents, yourself, um, planning and allocation of resources. And if there are new options that we can explore, the review should also guide us to that. In terms of conducting the review, um, there are different places that you will get information from. So yeah, we, reviewing a program, you cannot sit in a room and do it by yourself. You have to engage your stakeholders and other resources around you. So typically, it would be students, it would be teachers or trainers, it would be administrators, um, future students, interest groups, in this case, my, like um, PAWI, who has a stake or their own WISP, persons with experience in the content and any activities that could be observed to inform the process. What we are aiming to do today is to understand the environment that WIST is in at this point in time. We know that things have changed, most significant change being the effect of COVID, but things have changed around us. What we are providing may not be exactly hitting the target or we may be overreaching the target. So we're doing more than we should or we're doing less than we should. So we are trying to understand the environment that we are operating in at different points so that we can know what we need to consider in the um, review process and in redesigning the programs if we have to do any design. So we're looking at the spiritual, educational, perform, um, professional, social impact of waste, um, environmental and circumstances that impact Christians and Christian workers. If there are differences in the characteristics of graduates from the diploma versus the BA and well, Christian workers in 2024 and beyond. So let's just start by looking at with what we say we are about. Our vision is to be a leader in biblically based ministerial training for the Caribbean and beyond. So we're not reviewing these mission and vision statements. We're just looking at them and we're looking at key parts of them. Biblically based, ministerial, Caribbean and beyond. For the mission, providing higher education to equip Christians to be godly servant leaders for the fulfilling of the Great Commission. And our core values, Bible-centeredness, excellence, integrity, lifelong learning, and teamwork. And just for my reference, the Great Commission, um, Matthew 28, 16 to 20, but I'll just focus on um, 19 and 20. I, this, these are my highlights. The theologians in the room may highlight something else, <laughs> but these are my highlights. Go, teach all nations, baptize them, teach them to observe all things that I have commanded. I am with you always, even to the end of the world. So, this mission is to provide higher education, to equip Christians to be godly servant leaders in order to go, teach, baptize, teach to do all things that I've commanded you, I am with you always, even until you. Our quality policy states that it is our intention to be quality driven. And key here is to meet and exceed the requirements of our stakeholders. Hence the reason again, we must involve you in this process and we commit to satisfying the purpose for which the institution has been established and for other identified requirements. Our aim is to get it right the first time and every time. WIS has a documented, well, 
Yeah, or we are mainly Pentecostals. We are other persons here as well. The Powie Constitution and Bylaws, if you look in it, there is the Wish Charter. Sorry, yes, the Wish Charter and the Bylaws. And it outlines the purpose of WIS, which yeah, there are eight of them, but I'm not going to go through them word for word. I'm just going to go through the things that I've highlighted. Prepare men and women for Christian ministry, foster uh, missionary interests, prepare persons to live a better Christian life, effective Christian service, worthwhile Christian, opportunities for students to participate in Christian education and other church ministries, opportunities for lifelong learning and professional development, professional development of all staff, and to promote research and publication. According to the Howie Constitution, this is the purpose for which, which WIS is established. Now, this might be a little bit different um, from the original reason why it was established, because it was done so to train pastors um, to operate the West Indies district of the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada. So initially in the 1940s, our pastors came from Canada because we were part of the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada. And in part of their, what I could call exit strategy to make sure that there were sufficient and adequate persons, suitable persons to carry on the work the WIS was established to train persons as pastors. Now it um, embraces the wider English speaking Caribbean, and we have gone beyond pastoral training to now include evangelism, missions, counseling, Christian education, and other leadership training in paralegal organizations. We offer four programs in different areas, different locations. So we have the certificate program, which is done through the extension schools. We have the advanced certificate in Bible and theology, more popularly known as the ACBT. So the certificate programs are known as extension. The, all right, so I'm seeing my screen looking a little bit fuzzy. I hope you're seeing us well still. The advanced certificate, which is done completely online, so there's no face-to-face, -face, well, there's limited face-to-face -face contact for that program. And you have the Diploma in Interdisciplinary Studies and the Bachelor in Interdisciplinary Studies. The last two will have uh, specializations that the um, students can choose. Gail, and you can tell me if you've seen us okay. Right, okay, back to... All right, just a little snippet with regards to PAWI because WISP owns the PAWI and provides guidance. Sorry, PAWI owns WISP. <laughs> PAWI owns WISP. But, and they provide guidance as to our direction. There are 268 churches throughout the Caribbean that are Pawi churches. 52% of those are located in Trinidad, and that amounts to or equals to 143 churches. So the majority of Pawi churches are in Trinidad. Um, just move on. This graph shows you our membership outlay according to the island. So you can see the islands that we are in and it shows you our membership out there. So according to this document, this chart is taken from the PAWI 2020 conference book, which would have been the 38th biennial conference, which is a conference that did not happen. But according to this, there is a total of 56,830 Pawi members in the region. Of that amount, 24,620 are in Trinidad. At the bottom of the screen, you see in a little yellow um, box there. I guess just my curious mind, based on a conversation I was having with someone, I looked at the CSO statistics to see 
where we stand, the power we stand in relation to the demographics for Christians in Trinidad and Tobago. So there isn't a classification for Pawi. There's one for Pentecostal, Evangelical, and Full Gospel. Between 2000 and 2011, that's about a 10 year, 11 year difference, there was an increase of 108% in the number of persons calling themselves Pentecostal, Evangelical, or Full Gospel. Just want to point out as well, there is a very significant, over significant increase in the number of persons who did not share. So there's an 867% increase. And why is that important to us um, in terms of evangelism um, and persons that we can target for other things? Coming back to the figure for the Pentecostals, so there are 159,033 Pentecostal, Evangelical, and Full Gospel persons in Trinidad and Tobago. If we compare that to the figure from Pawi, um, when the Pawi persons are only 24,624 of that number. So I will leave you to kind of true on that. It has implications for even how we probably market our programs because then we may need to look outside of Pawi, but that is not necessarily our discussion this evening, but just true on it as we consider where the programs go. This last chart says, in terms of our credential workers in all our districts, the total is 542, 542 total, 58% of whom are in Trinidad and Tobago. So of that 542, 318 of those credential workers are in Trinidad and Tobago. So, we are getting into our questions. Our mission says that we are to equip ministers, sorry, Christians for service. All right, equip Christians to be godly servant leaders. Equip means to provide with the necessary materials or supplies for service or action. A synonym could be competent, which means having the requisite or adequate abilities and skills. A competency is a combination of skills, knowledge, and attitude. So in order for you to be considered competent in education or any other field, you must demonstrate Minimum skills, knowledge, and attitude. Knowledge is what we know, facts, the theories, the concepts. Skills is how we do things. There are established ways to do different tasks. Can we do or perform those things? And attitude, how we value what we do and our approach to those things. So this is important in terms of us considering what we ex what or the minimum waste is expected to provide to equip Christians to be godly servant leaders. I was trying to catch it back a thought that was there. Now, Reverend Harper promised me to do some more research to see if he finds any, but most times in industries, there the competency standards are established for tasks to be completed. And usually when you're writing a curriculum, you look to see what standards are established. So a carpenter, there's a standard at which a carpenter or the things that a carpenter must be know, do, and how he must behave. So Reverend Harper has promised to look to see if there's one for Christian workers, pastors, or anybody like that 
that we can use as part of this um, review process. So let's go to the questions now. The first one, in 2014 and beyond, because we're in 2023, we will not, the new curriculum may, will, or the revised or revisions may kick in from 2024. So in 2024 and beyond, compared to before 2000, what do you imagine Christianity or Pentecostalism will look like? What do you imagine the church environment will be like? How do you imagine technology will be used in the church? And what do you imagine a new Christian will look, or how that person would look, compared to a more mature Christian? So I don't know if they can um, do a split screen, something, so we can see who may be responding. Anybody want to take a first go at it? So <laughs> I do have a background in education. And when people are silent, you look for somebody and you call a name. Or you can put it in the chat. We would monitor the chat and respond as well. We know that we have persons, or we should have the persons here who would have graduated at least 10 years ago. When I checked the numbers um, this morning, we had persons who registered, who graduated from West more than 10 years ago. We had persons who graduated four to six years ago. Tell us what you think. Um, what we do Andrea, um, okay. Ms. Matano, would like to restate the question, please. In 2024 and beyond, compared to before 2000, the year 2000, what do you imagine Christianity or Pentecostalism would look like? What do you imagine the church environment will be like? How do you imagine technology will be used in the church? And how do you imagine a new Christian versus a mature Christian will be like? So let's take it one by one. Let's, it's four, let's just go through them. Is Christianity or Pentecostalism changing? Is it what you knew it to be when you became a Christian? For me, no, it's not, and I'm not, I'm not that old, <laughs> but there are, there are very clear differences in terms of um, the one that's kind of touchy for most people, how we dress, how we do worship, um, how perhaps churches are organized, um, the persons you see coming into church now may not look the way they looked when I would have started out. So there are some differences. I think as we move forward, 
those differences will become clearer, which may lead to some um, cultural tension, if you want to put it that way, because the older folks or the more mature persons will see things one way, because that's how we've experienced it. But the younger ones will not see it that way. And then there will be the challenge that persons who are going to lead the church are not the older ones, it's the younger ones. Um, so yes, for me, I do see some that Christianity would not look the way we experienced it before. And when I talk of dress, I'm not just talking about um, female dress. When you went to church, you would dress. But no, it's more, it was more formal. Now you have something that is more casual. So yes, for me, I do imagine that as we move forward, we will be having a different environment. Any thoughts on that? No? Is Evelyn there? Yes, I am here. Good evening, everyone. Do you have any thoughts on that, what I just said, or anything that, any of those questions? Um, I, if you could put back up the questions again, I have a thought on the last question. Which is, what do you imagine a new versus a mature Christian would be like? That's right. Number one. I... Quite frankly, I'm a bit concerned as to um, the, the aspect of pastors, mature Christians and the dress, the way they dress. I, um, I'm seeing too much of the world in the church. I don't know, sometimes there's a blur as to what the boundary is. Are we, are we Pentecostals or are we just a regular non-denominational church? Because we have a standard. And I'm afraid that we are drifting so far away from the standards of Pentecostalism and what it really means that it, it, I, I can't imagine what it would be like in 20 years. Um, I go into some Pentecostal churches and um, I, I, they, they're moving away so much from doctrinal teaching towards um, more prophetic and and different things and, and you, know, you, you know, get rich quick things. And, you know, it's, it's really changing. So it's up to the leaders to really set, um, maintain the standard of what our forefathers worked so hard to, to maintain. And in terms of so, the changes, um, what I've I just seen, stay there. you know, so far is that um, I, back in the 80s, 90s, when I were in Trinidad, as a Christian, it's different now. I was young then, and now I'm old. <laughs> and I'm in St. Vincent. But the difference is that I am seeing people grasping more knowledge of the scriptures, even the layman, even the new Christians. And they are looking for, as the person spoke before, they are looking for evidence that what we are seeing or what they are hearing is the truth. You know, but not only that, they also are looking for the way we live. They are looking to see true Christianity within the individuals. They are not only looking for scriptures alone, but they're looking that we are living the life that the Bible says that we ought to live. So that is the difference now. We could have lived anyhow long ago and people would have accept the word of God. But now they are looking for evidence of us. You know, like in the old time days and the Bible days, they want to see the true Christians because they want to know that that is the better way to live. This is better than the party. This is exciting. This is keeping us, you know, focused and grounded. I don't know if that makes sense. I, but I, what yes, I'm yes, yes, now. you're making sense. But I'm just thinking as well, um, in terms of the younger persons coming in and also finding that we, the older ones, need to budge. Um, if you are experiencing that, or is it that we are all of the same 
age group on this platform? No, I mean, um, seeing that people is really looking for how people are scrutinizing more. The young people are scrutinizing us. You okay. know, because they may want to live like what we live, but they want to know that this thing is working. This thing would work. You know, the world is not working anymore, but this is something that would work for us as young people. Right. So that's why I see the church is coming in the next couple of years or so. I see that is leading to that. People want to come in and they would come, but they want to see example from the older folks that we are living the life that we are called to live. And this is what the Bible says that we ought to do. We are truthful. We are honest people. So let me just thank you very much, Mrs. White. Um, COVID impacted technology in the church. We are having this meeting by Zoom. A lot of churches have continued to do their services online. With COVID, we had no choice. We found online. And for some of us, the online thing was not a good thing before COVID, but we found it, we used it, and now we can't leave it. How is technology, how do you see technology impacting us as we move forward, trying to show young persons or to give young persons the example that they want? I see Gidon. Yes. Hello. Good night, everyone. Good night. You hear me? Okay, you hear me clear. Um, I think technology is actually. Well, let me take up my phone and vibrate. Technology is actually an important aspect. Um. For the young people. So you spoke. You asked earlier about, like, if the church, if do if. In 2024, how do we see the church going forward, right? And um, of course, technology has to be part of it because we live in a world filled with technology. And believe it or not, a lot of things was going on back then. I I'm hearing people making comparisons of back then and now, but sin was raining since back then, but um, technology makes it easier to see what is happening in places, right? And I think technology could be a useful tool, tool to actually reach young people because young people are in their own world. Um, they operate in a different world. For example, you won't find much teenagers on Facebook. The only, the only way you might find them on Facebook if they probably don't have access to things like Instagram and Snapchat and TikTok and so forth. You'll find older people like my age, even though I'm young, but you don't find like 17 year olds, 16 year olds, or even if they have a Facebook account, um, they barely on Facebook because these youths live in a different world. They live in an Instagram world, they live in a TikTok world, they live in a whole different world. So the church on a whole have to embrace technology. We have to embrace um, young persons who might have that kind of creativity that we could use them to get the message out there. So how do I see the church changing? Um, not only doing crusades alone, but also doing things that could reach people on the internet. So not every time it will be go there and preach the gospel on the streets. Of course, we're, not, we're never going to leave that out. But um, now there are ways you could actually create content that you could actually just put out there and it could reach people quite on the next side of the world. So the technology part um, plays a big role in the church going forward. And I think persons at WIS has experienced that because during COVID, um, that's what we had to depend on. And well, all churches had to depend on it. So that's just my two cents when it comes to technology. Thank you, Gidon. Anybody else wants to comment or to add to what Gidon said? Yes, I would like to add to what Gideon said, and he is so correct that we can't get away from the use of the importance of the use of technology. And as someone who works in IT, yes, it has its drawbacks, because if you don't have a robust um, disaster recovery plan in place, 
if you don't have if you're not au fair with cyber security and um the importance of it you know it could cause the church to end up in a lot of trouble like tonight there we see we have a hacker uh, an active hacker so yes we would want to move towards technology but we also have to be advised as to what are the what are the risks involved in doing so thank you for putting that in i'd like to add one more thing if possible yes and then we will have mr thomas yeah and i'm pleased. I'm piggybacking on Sister Evelyn. Um, definitely, even with technology, we have to be careful because with technology now, it has made it so easy to sit down in your living room and listen to false doctrine. Um, I heard someone spoke earlier about um, people want to see the evidence and so forth. And even in that, some people will sit down and take in false doctrine because they're seeing things that look like deliverance, they're seeing things that look like miracles, they're seeing things that look like all these things. And when you really check out the teachings that are being taught by some of these people on the internet, um, it's far from scripture. So while techno technology has its good, it also has, it also gives a false perception of Christianity and it, it, it really is deceiving a lot of people. So then again, I guess that's a good reason why we need to get involved in technology. Thank you, Gideon. Um, so Mr. Thomas and then Patrick. Good day, everyone. Pastor Lou Thompson. And um, I want to thank the school for putting on this program. I think it's excellent. I would like to say, first of all, that I consider there is a tension between the older leaders, pastors, and the present youth in the church and some of the members, I consider we have an aging uh, leadership in Pawi, and a lot of congregation reflect that. The interest in the youth and programs designed to get the youth involved in the average Pawi church needs to be examined. Uh, youth are very, very much involved with IT, like the Instagrams, the Snapchat, chat, Twitter, and some of these things. And um, the churches which needs to make a note of that and, and maybe re-educate or have some new training uh, sessions to help the pastors understand that these are these this this is the way to communicate with today's youth. Whether we, we attract them or we don't attract them, that's the language, that, that's how they communicate. And uh, it will be in our interest. I have noticed that during the COVID, services were transmitted through the internet in the typical way, the contemporary way. And now that the uh, COVID has closed them, some are continuing to do it. They have not adapted. They have not taken the, the gospel message and put it in a form that will be accepted by the youth. Could we put a program that will be accepted to the youth in Instagram, uh, Instagram and Twitter and Snapchat and get a following, get people wanting to, to get in it because the way it, 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 the content of it and uh, I think one of the things that WIS needs to do is to let pastors know that they have to revise, the youth has to be included, they have to put the youth need to come into the church. Sometimes there's a tension between the older members and the younger uh, ones coming in, and the younger ones don't come, they just, they just fall away, and the older ones hold on to their leadership and refuse to move, saying, well, this is, this is the way we've always had it. So I think we need to look at it very carefully in terms of communication and that uh, tension between the ages. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I want to say, I just, just, we also, I'm seeing Patrick, so, so, so let me just, Dylan? Yes. Yeah. So I, I'm going to start limiting yes, my, 
Sorry, go ahead, Gillan. No, I said Mr. Sukran. Not hearing you. Not hearing you clearly. Mr. The Sukaran has his hand up. Oh yes, I I've acknowledged him. Good afternoon, everyone. Just a Good afternoon. Again. What I would want to see on the aspect of technology having a great impact on the future of the church by extension the the connection with the youth and the spreading of the gospel. We need to be very careful in terms of the balance that is created in terms of the book of Acts chapter 2, verse uh, 58 to 47, in terms of fellowship, in terms of, of, of relationship uh, within the, the congregation at the faith. Um, it would create an, an atmosphere of fellow worship, fellow relationship, and uh, that will probably tend to want to affect our teenagers in the say that uh, uh, building relationships, building intimacy, building family together, because um, uh, the internet will create such an avenue where um, everyone could find a different uh, kids to, to look and, 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 and be part of different principles, uh, but in terms of relationships, fellowship and fellow worship, uh, we need to be very careful and uh, have a balance in terms of the, the, the use of the uh, um, technology by extension. Again. So you were a bit muffled. I'm just going to try and repeat what you said to make sure we got it clear. So you're saying that we need to find a balance between the use of technology and the creation of relationships and fellowships among the members. Because other than that, we lose the fellowship element that is in highlighted in Acts. Basically, right? Yeah. All right, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so let's move on to question two. Thank you very much for your feedback in that area. Um, some things have already been highlighted that we will need to look at. So are you, thank you. Are you seeing the next slide? I'm frozen here. Right. So based on what we are talking about in terms of technology, um, Mr. Thompson, in terms of the gap between the older and the younger members, pastors, what will be required of Christian workers to attend to these things as we move forward? What should or how now should a Christian, a Christian worker or a minister perform his duties? What should he know? How should he sound? That sort of stuff. Now, part B comes in and probably kind of hints a little bit at what Mr. Thompson had said in that there is some, uh, some places there is the perception that you have to pay your dues. You have to go through the, the tunnel as I have done before you get to where I am now. But let's start with the first two parts. What do you imagine would be needed of a Christian worker or minister moving forward based on these things that we've looked at and how should he look, sound, and what should he know? Mr. Hand up. I'm on That's Ms. Okay, good night again. Um, I'm listening to the conversation tonight, and I would have I would have exited A levels and started with in 2011. Right? So I would have left 
soon after A levels in 2010, I would have joined with in January 2011, graduated in 2016. Um, one of the things I'm hearing tonight, there seems to be a large mistrust when it comes to technology, uh, the internet and stuff. And I am not denying the some of the um, challenges or some of the, the cons that may exist with media usage, but there seems to be a great distrust and an unwillingness to move forward in using this medium. And because it seems as though leadership is dragging their feet to use this medium, some of the um, advantages and the advancement that could happen because of its use is not happening. So I think one of the things that needs to happen for the leaders or should be required of leaders is that there's a willingness to not change the message. I want to make sure I'm clear on this, not change the message and the truth of God's word, stick to that, because that will get the job done. But be willing to use the mediums that are available to transmit that message. And this vast distrust and kind of skepticism that is existing around it will will not be um would only hinder what we can do so there has to be a willingness to adapt um stick to the truth of god's word keep his messaging stick to the biblical because that is what we want to be but allow ourselves to use the mediums that are present and not throw up these um these walls that kind of come up. We don't trust it. It this, it that, it that. Because for a young person hearing that, you're gonna say, you see, you all just you're not you're not getting it, and you're 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 not gonna be able to help with what is happening presently. So I think there has to be a willingness to adapt and use the mediums that are available. I hear you. I take your point, um, but I also know that that is a process in itself because you're looking at psychological changes and that doesn't happen overnight. So that will be a process. In, in between, we have to find a ways to make it work, but I know something like that, yes, it needs to be done, but it will be a process in itself. Um, Annie, is it Annie? We have Amina Court. Eh? Amina. Yeah. Hi, um, good night, everyone. Um, so in addition to what was just said around uh, utilizing technology and becoming familiar with it, um, I believe in response to the question that you asked, I think um, a sound understanding of scripture, right? Um, and I'm saying that from the perspective of not despising continuous professional development. And I'll use a pilot as an example. Even though a pilot will be a pilot for however long, he never stops learning. He never goes, he never stops um, refreshing himself on the fundamentals. And, and, and I think that is something that we must always, um, at least leaders should always try to continue to do. Right. Um, the second thing I would add to that is understand succession planning. Um, succession planning is a is a is a biblical concept, and it's not one that um, really should be frowned upon as what we are kind of seeing now. Um, understand how to harness the strength of others. So even though we are seeing technology um, is not the strong point of some of the the more aged people. Um, there are younger persons, and I, I mean, that was expressed before, there are younger persons who very much understand technology and understand its uses and its strengths and how it could possibly benefit the church, right? And then the last thing I would add to that, and this might be a little bit controversial, but know when your time is coming to an end, know when, you're, when the curtains are really come drawing down for you. Um, so knowing when to pass the battle as it will, because sometimes you see people they, they're going down 
you're down, 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 and you're not letting go of, you know, um, a particular position or a particular role. And that is really discouraging to younger people. People would lose interest in, in really wanting to participate in ministry and really wanting to um, keep the more traditional roles, I would say. People would more lean to what is more contemporary. So I, I think in, in, in answering your question, those are the things that I would like to put forward. So as a follow-up to both of you, so we've talked about, you've shared in terms of the older ministers needing to know when to let go and to adapt to the technology and all of that. Do we also need to do anything with the younger ministers in order to prepare them to enter an environment which is not going to change overnight? They themselves may have to be what we are just say, the agents of the change that you are looking for. And it may not mean, it will not mean going into a church and telling a pastor, you need to do whatever. There are nice little subtle ways you can get things done. So in terms of preparing younger ministers, is there anything that we can do or that should be done to help them enter this environment that now exists, hold on onto it and make the changes that we are here saying it needs to be done. So I've seen three hands. Um, let's start with a Amina. Amina was, was, was speaking just now. So All right. We so have then, Altair and Tracy again. All right. So go ahead, Altair, and then Tracy. Okay. Thank you, Galen. Good night. Yes. Good night, everyone. Right. You hear me? Yes. Are you all uh, hearing me? Yes, we are. Right. Um, okay. So I, I came into the Pentecostal church from being a Catholic, and I was serving in ministry when I was a Catholic. So when I came into the Pentecostal church, it was not a problem to be able to serve wherever I was needed. From someone who has worked to the Bible school and have met students, many early students come into Bible school unprepared for ministry. And I believe that um, the churches and the pastors and the, the young people should be working together and grooming these young people and finding all their giftings and all of that. So that they, when they come to Bible school, they're a little more prepared. And some people version of Bible school is that they just come to learn about the Bible and they could sing and they could evangelize and all that. But even in the area of social care, many of them clueless about it. There are many other things that they don't know. So um, if we have a lot of women coming into Bible school, we don't have women study. So something probably we could consider having on our curriculum to help our leaders and um as you are saying we need to, to be mentoring them so when they come they'll be a little more prepared because they come to the bible school and they go back and sit down in the church it makes no sense thanks okay um tracy is it tracy hand is off um tracy. amina you want to say okay. something yeah, so, so I would add to your question, that's where succession planning is most important, right? Um, so, so understanding the ministry as it is now is, is a huge part of what ministers um, have to do really to pass the battle. So, so helping us to understand what is there and not only what is there, but to understand, help us to understand what we see. It's a huge part of succession planning. So it's not really, uh, while well, I understand paying your dues and, and doing your time and apprenticeship and all of those things, um, all of those things really make up what succession planning is. So it's really helping younger folks and younger people coming in to, into ministry to understand what is required of them as a minister. It's not about doing it the way we've always done it. It's about understanding what it takes to be a minister and understanding what it takes to fulfill your role in the ministry. Not as it is the way we've done it in the 1970s, the 80s, and the 90s, but understanding what it takes. So even though that will take a different form, 
in a different time. The fact of the matter is the underpinning knowledge that a person would require as a minister, the underlying characteristics, they would have that. So even though how the message is delivered, the, the vehicle that is, is used might change, the fact that you are you have these underlying char characteristics that are passed on from those who were who are going on before us, that is what is important. So let me just, I, I might be kind of going ahead in terms of our process, but I just want a, a kind of a yes or no answer. Um, going back to Amina, is it then, because some persons may not be able to go through a deep mentorship before they come into Bible school, is it then that we should do our internship earlier? Um, yeah, definitely. One of the things that I really like about internship is the length of time that it is. So, so the fact that you spend a year um, really uh, under somebody else's coaching is, is very is very good to me. What what I would probably um, say is that the, the, the quality of the internship may need some improvement. But yes, you could definitely start with internship being a little bit earlier or maybe um, uh, changing the framework that, that that internship takes. Not not the second year internship, but the first one, the first year internship. That could actually, you know, so that students are not just there and fulfilling any ordinary role or whatever is left over to do or whatever the pastor feels like assigning to you. But really and truly, the focus would be on developing this person to be to come into the gifting that they have been called to. So so that would be, I, I would agree with that. Okay. Thank you. Tracy. You're welcome. Tracy. Yeah. Um what I'm saying is the principles that former leaders would have learned um, and they would have had to carry out the leadership and to lead successfully. Those are the same principles that younger ministers would need to learn. The principles would be the same, the integrity and the love for people, all these things, what scripture requires of leaders, those principles will be the same. It's really about capturing um, those young people at the different seasons of their life, capturing them while they are members in a church, capturing them while they are in Bible school, capturing them while they exit Bible school. So there should be a process going before Bible school, during Bible school, after Bible school, so that you can have the easy flow of succession that you desire. Um, and in some ways that happens because that is how you get people into Bible school. So I think in, in some ways it is already happening because that is how some of these, some of the young people that are entering, entering Bible school at a young age, that's how it's happening. It's because they've had good biblical training they've, and there has been a, they have experienced the call and they've responded to that. And so they end up in Bible school because of that. So it's happening. It's happening in the church. It may not be happening to the extent we desire it to, as well as the pace we desire. It. And so those are things we may have to look at to change, but it is happening in some shape or form. Hence the reason you have some young people entering Bible school and then exiting Bible school and going into full-time ministry. Um, when they are in Bible school, I know there there is, I, I don't know what it, what it was, what the name of those court, those um sessions where you would have um, a lecturer or some a pastor assigned to a group of students, and they would meet maybe once a week or something, um, and and the person would be mentoring them. But in those sessions, you'd go through a few things. But I think something like that would need to happen maybe more frequently and possibly give more a uh, more personalized attention for, for in order to create the kind of succession we're desiring. And then also the students as they are leaving WIST, if you want to capture those young leaders that came in there and you don't want to lose them, then getting them into the districts they belong would be an idea. So while they are in Bible school, getting them to apply for credentials or get involved so that they can be at those um, those rap sessions with pastors and learn and 
here and kind of develop, capturing them while they're in Bible school. So there's not that kind of drain pipe when they're leaving Bible school to enter into full-time ministry, because that is where some of the fallout exists. If you can get them within their respective districts and get them involved uh, and get pastors to, to mentor them as they are coming out to help set them up in ministry, that I think would also help our succession planning as well as the aging process we have going on presently. Thank you very much for the feedback. Um, quite a bit of things for us to chew on as we continue. So let's just move on to Riyadh to have a, uh, input on this question. Yes, good night, everyone. Good night. Uh, can you all hear me clearly? Yes, we are. I think my little input onto this, my little two cents, is that um, when it comes to the ministers and what the ministers for the future needs to look like and what they need to be trained to do, I think they need to be able to be prepared to confront the, the, the contemporary issues that are coming up in society. We have, we have the situation with COVID. We have the question that arose about whether the vaccines was the mark of the beast. You have this LGBTQ plus, 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 whatever they may add there. And, and how do young people in schools deal with that? Where the world is including it more and more and more. It's going to a point where you'll be persecuted for saying Jesus is God. And what, what, what I see missing is ministers or ministers that are capable to defend the gospel and are willing to engage in debate and willing to stand up. And because if, if we don't create these platforms and, and actually have these conversations, then, and I'm talking about not just within our churches, I'm talking about outside our churches, to give some feedback when a news issue happens, to offer some, some editorial to the newspaper, when a political issue comes up as well, from a Christian standpoint, from a church standpoint, what about us engaging with other churches within other denominations for the sake of just unifying the church, but for the sake of also confronting the, the issues that we dance around and we, we don't confront it so much. We stay within our own little kingdoms. And I, I'm not trying to criticize anyone. I'm just saying that the minister for the future has to be willing to be that sharp sword. He has to be willing to, <clears throat> to say the things that may offend others, but because it is the word of God, it is the right thing, and it will cause us to change. So we need to start training our ministers to be that advocate, that apologist. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm just putting that as a two cents tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much, Riyadh, for that. Um, we, the LGBT issue ill. I am doing. I am seeing um, Kathleen and I think Brenda, but yeah, we can't ignore that LGBT um, issue moving forward, especially given what they are planning or how they are strategizing to get their things done. So we'll just take Kathleen as the last response to this one, and then we'll move on to question three. Good evening, everyone. Um, in terms of the question put forward, what our ministers should look like in, in this season, when I do believe that um, the fundamentals should be in place, being grounded in the word, being filled with God's Holy Spirit, and so that you, you need to be from a position of where your faith comes, is that your faith needs to be clearly, or we need ministers that has a clear cutness with what they believe and where we are going. We need, um, I think what we need is that uh, tenacity in terms of your spiritual boldness that you're recognizing that in where we now are in the world is that your Christianity should not allow you to be comfortable in the sinfulness of our world. So you, you are boldly addressing some of the issues like the LGBT stuff that was just mentioned before, but that in where you are going in terms of who you are as a Christian is that 
is not colorful and is, is, is not is not you're not going to be comfortable in, in your decisions that you would make but all ministers need to stand firm for what you believe say what you believe know what you believe and to be able as the person would have spoke before to be able to clearly um define who you are as a christian and not be afraid of it not be afraid of the issues and to confront them because you know what you stand on Thank you very much. I would leave my thing for another meeting. Um, we press on. It's not a bad comment. It's just one of those things that will take us down another road of discussion. So we move on to number three. Thank you very much, everybody, so far. Right. So our vision statement says that Wiss will be a leader in biblically based ministerial training. Our mission says to equip Christians. So one speaks about ministerial training, one speaks just generally about equipping Christians. What is ministerial work? What do ministers do? What are the basic entry requirements for ministerial work? What is the end goal of ministerial training? And I wonder, shouldn't be, but I wonder if there is a perception that different jobs are more aligned to the Great Commission or different roles, ministerial roles, are more aligned to the Great Commission than others. Do few members or department heads, those of us who are in body ministry, do they need formal training? And let me just say what formal training is. Give you a definition. All right, so, all right. Formal training is always organized and structured. There are learning objectives. It is always intentional. Informal training, is never organized, there are no set objectives, and there are no set learning outcomes. It's more learning by experience. So coming back, in terms of the last question, do formal, do few members, department heads, those persons involved in body, body ministry, do they need formal training? So let me just see if I could get this back up. I need to go back to the right, I'm there. So this is the question we are looking at now. What is ministerial training? What are the boundaries of it? Who do ministers serve? What are the basic entry requirements of ministerial work? What is the end goal of ministerial training? Are there some jobs that work better towards the fulfilling of the Great Commission? And do, do few members, department heads, or those involved in body ministry need formal training? I'm seeing Kathleen says a hard for people to see lives transformed. For the purpose of the kingdom and yes, we need formal training. Yes to regular members, right? Anybody wants to take? So let's, let's just, this is a, a, a question that we know that we're grappling with even in terms of with preparing a strategic plan. Who is a minister? Is it only the pastor, the evangelist, the head of the CED department? Who is a minister in terms of sharing the gospel? No takers so far? All right, let me go another way again. Do I need to have, this is a question a little lower down, but I'll just jump on it a little bit. Do I need to have a bachelor's degree in order to be prepared to work in the ministry? Or is it sufficient for me to have 
an associate degree, a diploma, or a certificate? Or can I just come out of school with A-levels, do a short course at WISC, and that is sufficient to prepare me for ministerial work? Yes, Kathleen. Good. Um, good night again. Um, yes, I do believe that all of us do need formal training. And I do believe that based on the level in which we are operating at, then more training will be required based on the office that you, you, you hold, that more training will be required. But I believe in, in management, in, in the scope of things that every person, every member of an assembly needs to have some sort of level of training in order for things not to be haphazard and for things not to not have a, a, a focus or for you not to have a specific goal that you're working towards. So in terms of training, yes, that we all need training. In terms of, yes, we need training, but it is on, it's, in, it's, it's infringed on the office in which you hold, what the amount of tra training that one may need. Okay, so different levels of training. For a lay worker, do I need a bachelor's degree? Or a department head, do I need a bachelor's degree or is something lower than that sufficient? I'm seeing Riyad and Kathleen again. Go ahead, Riyad. And there's somebody else. Oh, I'm My thinking about this is that the Bible specify what is the qualifications for elders and for ministers or pastors. So sorry, by that standard, we... sorry, sorry, Riyad, could you just repeat yourself? You're a little bit muffled. Are you hearing me now? Yes. yes. Go ahead. I was saying that um, the Bible set standards for elders and deacons in the church and, um, and for pastors as well. So I would think that the qualification should be some training at the point where they are able to teach and exactly what the bible would have said through paul to timothy and titus and the others but apart from that i don't think we should put up a strict restriction that if you don't have an associate degree or if you don't have a bachelor's you can't qualify but because by that jesus and all the apostles would be disqualified as well okay okay Kathleen. Yes, in um, keeping things in perspective, based on your, your definition that you would have speak about in terms of what training is and what not being trained is. And so in terms of what you would have said, I'll, again, I'm going to say, yes, we all need training. No, the thing is experience is a, a teacher that we, we would learn from. And there are people who would have been in church for years and so because you have been in church for years and you are learning which you are being trained but not necessarily a formal training where you have certification in the training but that does not necessarily mean that you are not equipped for an office because you have not had formal training where you are getting a certificate or a piece of paper that says that you have formal training in that and i am not bashing education I am an educator, has been for over 17 years, and I recognize its place. But we, in, in terms of where we go into the kingdom, um, I, I think oftentimes we would have um, misplaced where, in terms of where we put our training as, because we recognize that we are not having that continuity. And it's why we, we are now seeing a fall off in terms of where our young people is at, is because that continuity in terms of how the ministry propels because there's no clear-cut goals. And so based on what you would have said in terms of what training is, yes, we need clear-cut goals. So I'm going to insist that, yes, we need that formal training in order for us to move on. Um, so I am seeing Amina is next. Yes. And then we have, uh, Dr. Harper, so that, uh, that we don't mix them up. And then Donald, go ahead. Okay, so um, I, I want to take this question from the perspective of um, the word, right? So, so we are, as ministers, our ministers, anybody who participates in, supports, 
um, the ministry of the gospel, so uh, propelling the gospel. That's that's what it is for me. F for me, that person has to be governed by something, and that something is the word of God. And whether you call it a certificate, an uh, uh, advanced certificate, a diploma degree, uh, whatever, a master's, a doctorate, um, Th those are the those are the vehicles with which we we learn the word. Those are the those are the avenues for us to actually learn the word. And for me, the more you learn the word, is the better minister you become. So for me, formal training most definitely would need you know your your apprenticeship style training, your more informal training. But but there is there is no substitution for getting the word of God into you and understanding it because when you get into ministry. That is what upholds your integrity. That is what upholds your ability to do what you have to do in the face of every single difficulty that you would face as a minister. For me, there is no replacing that. No, 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 no. Whether you start at a certificate and you go all the way up to, and I think that's why they have levels so that you, you get your feet wet and then you continue and then you build on that and you build on that. So, so for me, there is no replacing of that. For me, every single person in ministry has to be able to have a solid firm foundation in the wood. Thank you very much. I'm Reverend Harper. Dr. Harper. Yes, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Um, I would just like to share a uh, perspective. I'm not sure if anyone would have um, spoken to this before I came on. Um, based on the state of state of um, the local church in our organization, based on the fact that growth seems to be stymied in many local churches, based on the fact that missions and evangelism um, do not seem to be one of the focal areas or the focal area in the local church, probably in, well, not probably in some churches, yes. Given that the primary focus and primary responsibility of the local church is to make disciples of all nations. I wonder if there is a missing element in relation to focusing and refocusing the adherence mindset to what is the main purpose of the existence of the church in the first place? Why does the church exist? And that is to carry out the mandate, which is the primary responsibility of its ex existence, making disciples of all nations. Um, something that we need to look at whether churches are more internally focused or externally focused. An internally focused church would concentrate more on departmental activities and what happens inside the building. The externally focused church would go into the building in order to prepare people for what happens outside. And so going in the ministry of the word, the sermons, the Bible study, the training, everything that goes on in there inside the building should have as its primary approach is to shape people and challenge people to be witnesses for Jesus wherever they go, uh, wherever they find themselves, because everybody has a sphere of influence. If we are concerned and serious about growth at the local level, uh, every personal growth impacts on the local church. Every church, local church growth impacts on the organization growth of the church impacts the nations. And I'm wondering if we need to look, begin to look outside of the four walls more than just internally. So I'm thinking that there is need for training for the local constituents that people would understand uh, the need to be challenged and training could, could take different forms. There's the formal, there's informal and there's non-formal training. Um, every missionary who's on the field right now was trained somewhere. And every, every candidate preparing for missions or is on the mission field right now started at a local church somewhere, affiliated somewhere. And so I think that we need to refocus on getting our 
pastors and leaders involved, directly involved in helping to shape and challenge people with regards to their responsibility to be witnesses for Jesus Christ everywhere they go. And so everyone may not end up at WIST, but every single believer in Jesus Christ needs to be trained in some form. And there are creative ways to do that. At the end of the day, we have to, again, revisit what is the purpose of the church? Why do we exist? Why do we go to the building? Why does the church go to the building? We go to the building to be sharpened, to be encouraged, to be retooled, to be tooled so that we can be effective witnesses wherever we go. And the nations are crying out. The local churches, the local uh, villages, communities are crying out. And so should we therefore um, be returning to the conversation about what do we do in the building? That's my submission for now. So before, um, before I take, there was another hand. No, there is no other hand. So before I just go, let me just come back to one of the purposes of a WIS. Number two, I'm not going to put it up. I'm just going to read it. Foster ministry interests and to help ministry candidates to prepare for their fields of calling. That is one of the purposes of a WIS. Sorry? What did I say? Sorry, foster missionary interests and help missionary candidates to prepare for their field of calling. Let me just say it again so it's clear. The second purpose of WIS is to foster ministry, missionary interests and help missionary candidates to prepare for their field of calling. Kind of getting ahead of ourselves, but based on our conversations in terms of planning, we recognize that this is something we have to look at because perhaps we are not approaching it in the way that would foster missionary interest. So as we go forward, we will have a sub-meeting relating to missions and evangelism and flesh this out as to how we're going to do it because we do recognize that it's not something that we may be doing effectively. All right? So thank you for that. So there are no more hands. We go on to number four, which is I've kind of touched on in terms of yes, we have a somebody's oh Haynes have, Fraser. Okay, go Haynes ahead. Go ahead, Reverend Fraser. Fraser. Is he there? Mr. Fraser? All right. So, uh, if you're, okay. I'm okay. Hear me. Go ahead. Yeah, so I just want to um, support the piggyback a little bit, a little bit on uh, Dr. Sapper's um, contribution in respect to uh, what's happening in terms of the local churches, with respect to training. I know emphasis on missions, uh, evangelism, which I believe is part of our mission as it's school, and also in terms of you know the Christ mission and calling. And I believe that we can focus or give some emphasis in terms of I know the particular call that we have, growing a great commission that talks about making disciples, they do intentionally make disciples. I think that's an area where the local churches, in terms of um, not in terms of students being that sort of pioneering and you know maybe starting new churches and so on. But I believe there's some collaboration with the school, with and Powie, and sort of bringing on board that emphasis, that drive, that rigorous, you know, perspective in terms of the students and the school, Powie and the churches, seeing the separation making. Is a quote that drugs that Dr. Roy do teach at course. I know rigorous has been pushed in terms of its involvement in the Powie you know, into the chain, which the pastors in being involved in some aspect of it, so that we have that 
violent collaboration to fulfill the, the school's mission and also Christ's great commission. So I support Dr. Papa's um, point speaker that a priority first burner issue in terms of training and involving the power churches at some level, the pastors, other than the students to really drive that process forward. Yeah, that's the contribution. Okay, so you were a bit muffled, so let's just repeat it to see if we here yeah, got it clearly. You're supporting Dr. Harper, and you're suggesting that there needs to be greater collaboration between WIST and PAWI in terms of fostering the mission interests in the local churches. Yes? Reverend Fraser? He's gone? No, I was just sitting from difficulty that I'm unmuted. Okay. Yeah, that's exactly what I said. Exactly that. Yes. All right. Yes. Thank you very much. So, okay, so we have two now. Um, let's take Dr. Ford and then we'll take Terry Cummins. And the next one, we should wrap it up quickly because we started discussing it already. So go ahead, Dr. Ford. Yes. Um, in regards to the question of who is a minister. And um, if a person has to have a bachelor's degree, et cetera, um, I believe first and foremost that a minister is one who is called by God, first point. Um, not just a matter of going to a Bible school and graduating and then you are classified as a minister because you have a diploma or a bachelor's degree or whatever. Um, that doesn't make you a minister. You have to be called by God and anointed by God uh, because there are persons who um, have um, they have been inspired and motivated by God to enter the ministry long before, even when they were on sale and living in the world, God had called them out to the world and has called them into the church and uh, given them that anointing to participate in ministry. The other things will come, the bachelor's degree, the diploma, et cetera. Those things will come because God will, will lead you and, and progressively you will develop and you would, and, and I'm speaking of um, um, experientially from my own point of view, where I came from, you know, and so I can understand that, you know, even way before the, 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 the schooling, et cetera, person has to be called and anointed by God, and then there'd be a process of where the person then grows and develops and becomes that man or woman of God that God has called them to be. Thank you. So could I just ask uh, a bit of a follow-up here? Um, Given the challenges of attending WIST, all wrong challenges, do you think that persons will enter WIST without some sort of nudging that they need to get into or sharpen themselves for ministry? Um, I believe here is where Ephesians 4, um, verse 11 to 15 speaks about um, that God has given some to be apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors, teachers for the preaching of, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of ministry and for the edifying of the body of Christ. So here's where pastors come in now that, that they're coming and they're encouraging and, and, and help um, develop persons that they see the mentor and, and they give guidance along those lines so that, um, you know, it, it is, and again, I'm speaking from experience, um, you know, so, so as, as it the pastor speaks the word and, and encourages and, and, and mentors um, that that is developed, that that yearning, that urging, that, that, that call is recognized in the person's life and, they, and they, um, they go towards it as it's recognized, as they, as they feel the calling, as they understand God's purpose for their lives. Um, then they go towards that, 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 that part in, in developing the ministry and, and working towards, um, as it says, the, for the perfection of saints that all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, and that they no longer be tossed to and fro like children, but they be, you know, they be um, encouraged then. Um, I'm, I'm speaking from Ephesians chapter four in, in, in that regard. So, um, so okay. the person um, has been evangelized, they have come to the church, they are still babes, then they are, they are encouraged by the pastor and by the, minister, by the other ministers in the church, and then it flourishes from there and they become. Um, recognize the calling and walk in it um, accordingly. Again, I'm speaking from experience and not from just some theoretical perspective. 
Thank, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Terry? Hi, Pleasant Good night. So um, I would like to contribute. Now, firstly, um, if you're looking at ministers, we are all ministers. Once you are born again believer, you are minister of, of the gospel. You, you, you are representative of Christ, right? So you don't need a bachelor degree or, 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 or some kind of qualification to, to, to be a minister. However, I want to um, iterate the, the importance of training to be able to have correct doctrine. And to ensure that in terms of if you're talking about holding, holding specific office in, 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 in churches and so on, um, training is essential. Uh, you get the true experience. And this is where the role of the local assembly comes in. I think the local assembly has failed in some regard because um, it, the role of the local assembly is to make disciples of men. I heard Dr. Harper would have um, um, indicated such, right? And I agree with that. So I want to um indicate those essential aspects training is important experience um attending with getting a degree that's gonna add and so on is gonna add to your development as a as a as um to, as based on the call as my my brother just indicated there based on the call of going on your life and and the area of ministry in which you want to function so it, i think formal training is important Informal training is also important when you call experiential training and so on. That is also critical. You may have a degree, but you may lack the experience. So it's a, it, we have to strike a balance where those things are concerned, right? Um, as the scripture said, study to show yourself approved. Now, we will say that the disciples and so on didn't have a, the apostles didn't have a degree, but they spent a, quite a, a, a significant amount of time with Christ. He was training them, he was teaching them for years, right? Before he launched them out in full ministry, right? So I wanna end there, sis. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we are approaching our proposed time, end time. So I would hold my comments for when we have those other sessions. So let's just go on to. Number four. Right. So as I said, we touched on some of this before. How significant is a bachelor degree? And even Terry would have just spoken to that. The lower levels of certification in formal education. So let's skip this. I think we've covered this. Yes, Reverend Harper. All right, so let's move on. We're going on to number five. And here we are asking, in terms of persons that you would know, some have a diploma, some persons would have had the bachelor's degree. Is there a difference in terms of their operation. We expect that there's going to be a difference in terms of knowledge, but in terms of, is, is there something that you could tell this person has a bachelor and this person has a diploma? That's one. Is there a difference if you have experience? And I think we've kind of touched on this, the ministers who would have graduated in the early days versus those who would have probably graduated from 1990 to um, 2020, 22, which would have been last year so is there a difference in operation and, and um knowledge and behavior pattern between a diploma graduate and a bachelor graduate somebody who has a bachelor's degree let's start there anybody has encountered both types of graduates Yes, Amina, thank you. 
Um, I, I think I would say that there is there is a difference simply because um, the further on you go, you've just mentioned it, the, the more knowledge you have. But um, I think the further on you go, it's the more tools that you get to properly um, or, or, or to rightly divide the word of truth. So your interpretation, your ability to take scripture in context, your ability to share scripture um, in a way that is meaningful and applicable um, is, a, is a bit better when you go on to um, the, the, the bachelor's level, you know, because I, I think being a bachelor's student myself, I think there, there was a difference in my own progression and my own ability to really study and dissect and understand simply because I would have tackled some more difficult courses in, in terms of being able to interpret what scripture says. Thank you, and that you've had both experiences. Yes, Dr. Frederick. Nothing. Okay, yes, good. Good evening. Um, very healthy discussion. I want to just quickly say, though, um, when you're dealing with this particular subject, one has to make sure that you're comparing apples with apples and not comparing apples with oranges. And I tell you what I mean. Um, a person carrying a particular level of qualification, um, if put against one who carries a more advanced level of qualification, all things being equal, the person with more advanced level of qualification should perform at a higher level. The reality is, however, but we take into consideration. Yes, the, uh, the reality is that a person who would have had whether it's a certificate or a diploma or a first degree also, let's assume that the individual had that for some time, but they may not have added academic qualifications to the to their portfolio, but they continue studying and developing themselves so that you could find a person who may have a, a what is compared a low qualification, but in performance, their level is could be even as high as or even higher than one who carries a more advanced level qualification. No, this is, happens, this is what happens in real life. Um, and this, the reality is, as I'm saying, one has to make sure you're comparing apples with apples. Now, if a person had a, a diploma for years but did nothing to develop themselves, no, you I mean you're, you're talking about a different categories, but I'm talking about folks who would have had that particular qualification but went on to personally develop themselves. I mean, you may find that they may have the same level of proficiency as one who has a higher level of qualification. I mean, I think it's a case where sometimes they, they, um, they may not have, it's just that they may not have been recognized or they have not done official courses to improve the academic level. But I mean, but again, back to the initial thing, you got to compare apples with apples because I know that we have had some some pastors, bless their, their hearts, they may have had just the original Bible school training of a three-year course, but they went on to develop and study and their level of performance equals some people who today even carry even doctoral levels. Their performance at this, mark you, they may not be recognized. That's, that's the thing. But I mean... There was a time when we were not so blessed, and I'm, I'm saying this lovingly. God has blessed us tremendously. We've got some very sharp and keen preachers. I mean, I sometimes admire them greatly. And however, as I said, we all have had some who came from the yesteryear, all right? But they have, they have, they know how to effectively. I mean, dissect that word and help us. They've helped us tremendously. 
and don't despise that they are small things. At the end of the day, as one who believes in the principle of growth, development, and training, we must all make an effort to improve ourselves. Seriously, study to show ourselves, improve to God. And when the when this situation arises that you can you can have that qualification, I mean, put in a formal manner, get it done. Seriously. You become all things to all men, and by all means, you win some. I rest my case. God bless you. What I'm enjoying is. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Frederick. And I think that is a point um, well taken in terms of, yes, you may have someone with a diploma, but they continue to read and expose themselves to certain things that brings them up to the same level as a bachelor's degree. So I, I take your comment there. We will just take Kwesi as the last person on this question. Good night, everyone. Good night. And I greet you all in the match. Um, I'm listening throughout the whole night and um, for most of the, the, the instances. And from this particular question, I will answer and say that um, I have experience where I have seen someone um, who has the qualifications of uh, a bachelor, Again, someone who has the qualifications of a diploma, and I saw where sometimes knowledge actually hinders relationship. And some people believe that um, the, the some people believe that the deeper they go, sometimes they catch themselves depending on what they learn rather than the relationship that they have with God. So I think sometimes it comes down to the individual and their love and their relationship in the same aspect um, of me being the last person. I'll throw this in, um, that all the way back when you were speaking about, and I heard people make reference in terms of um, being positioned and being, um, you know, equipped enough and who knowing when to give up and when to hand up. And I'm saying that um, I think from the time you, you came in contact with God, you have a burning desire to save souls. So don't matter. Um, before you are equipped, you are equipped and your e being equipped is just to share what God has taken the opportunity to share with you. So before you are positioned, you have a possession of the Holy Spirit that urges you to actually share what you have. So I don't think most times that because for me, coming to West, I don't even have um, a, a position that I'm actually thinking about, but I'm here to possess what and make myself more equipped to do whatever God have me to do on the nation road on, 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 you know, I remember growing up and I see a long time from corner to corner, you will hear, um, open air long time. Everybody preaching the gospel, everybody going out to share it. Everybody want to be a part of the gospel. Share. Now we have people waiting for position in the church on the pulpit to be recognized in order or to be, to, to, to have a credential in order to say that I have what God called me to be. But the reality, when you look at the streets, um, not talking religion, where I see Jehovah Witnesses, they are not trained and equipped, but they are there, and every they're moving from house to house to tell somebody about their faith. They have the Israelites on the promenade, day in, night out, Friday nights, coming out to speak. How trained are they? But we who have the power of the Holy Spirit to tell someone that Jesus loved them, we don't. But we are waiting for a position to do so. So I think, yes, training is paramount it is important but um what is more important is your relationship with god that when he sends you to be equipped with what he wants you to be equipped with you are ready to share it at whatever level you are at don't wait for a position to share what you possess so i think that as individuals we ought to revisit ourselves and understand as much as you are equipped there are people who need it your neighbor need it your friend need it. Wherever you are, it is needed. And that's why God is actually equipping us and training us. And that's just my two cents. Thank you very much for saying it, even having listened to everything. So at least you, you've shared your point. And um, I think it's a good point as well. One question, and this will decide if determine if I go to the next one. Is there anybody here who... Um, was part of West when it was a day school so that you would have had to live on campus and you came to school during the day? Is there anybody here like that?
Kamsin, Dr. Harper, anybody else? All right, so then I will, I will skip this question because this one requires us to have persons who would have had both experience, well, persons who would have experienced day versus persons who would have experienced the evening school early. So I would leave that one alone. Um, I want to thank you very much for your participation. I think this was a very fruitful session. I do have quite a few things to go and just turn over and uh, see how we take all of it on board. I don't think there's anything here that we can leave. Um, everything here has to be considered in some form or fashion. As I said, and also Reverend Harper would have said, we will have a further session um, looking at themed areas. So the first set of areas that we would look at would be like evangelism and missions, Christian education and youth and psychology, because those are areas that we have programs in. So we will want to have some discussion around those areas so we know how to um, look at those programs. So there is going to be um, further outreach. Perhaps what we would do, not perhaps, we'll have to find a way to make sure that the technology is a little bit more secured. <laughs> but we would definitely reach out to you again and ask you to participate um, so that we can get this thing in a way that it meets your needs as we move forward. So. Thank you very much for your participation. If you want to reach out to any of us, you could even, I mean, it may be a little while to just try and write down these email addresses, but you can send a message to um, Mrs. Charles Herrera and she would pass it on to us or even um, Mrs. Kerr, because I think you all would have contact with Mrs. Kerr and Reverend Harper. If you want especially to be part of those discussions, please let us know so that we would know to contact you first. Thank you very much for your input tonight. And I turn the podium to Reverend Warren Harper. Um, Sister Andrea, um, I'm seeing Dr. Rivers hand is up. Yes, Dr. Rivers, we will hear you. Oh, good evening. Good evening. Um, no, I just wanted to ask a question. Um, I had a number of points, but I was I was not sure if faculty was expected to contribute at this session, or um, or there is a forum for such another forum for such. Okay, yes, um, as Andrew would have said, this is just one of the different kinds of information gathering sessions that we would have. And uh, what we wanted today was to have a broad uh, contribution where we would have gotten from uh, a, a cross section of stakeholders simultaneously. Right? We got some comments from faculty in Barbados, in Trinidad, um, and uh, we got from students, past, present students, and um, both in Trinidad again and outside. And we wanted this kind of setting to be the first of the kinds of sessions that we would have had. We also will be having sessions with different specific demographics because we have to hear from our faculty, all the faculty, Trinidad, Barbados, Tobago, we have to talk to uh, the faculty and, and hear those concerns um, some of you have been teaching the programs, getting feedback there. We are going to be talking to the students. Uh, and, and when we are saying this, we want from all the programs as well, because we need to hear those of you who are currently experiencing the programs. And uh, we also want to be getting into the demographics in our churches. We want to, those prospective persons, we want to hear from you. We, we're going to be talking to districts, district officers, pastors, et cetera. 
So this is to be wide, it's supposed to be comprehensive. And um, because uh, Andrea had mentioned some specific programs that were, that they are still on the books, but they have been um, kind of dormant. So before a clear decision could be made on those in this review, we have to have conversations around those, those things like the youth ministries, the missions, the, um, the Christian education, psychology. Um, you know, these programs, we, we, this is meant to be a deep dive. And um, so, yes, we're going to be doing that. And um, we have a lot of information to work with. We have a lot of things to consider. We're glad for all the feedback we've been getting. And, um, and we, we want to encourage you to use those numbers. You have comments you want to make. Anybody, uh, please send it because we, we have to take all of this. Part of what we'll be doing, as I mentioned in the beginning, is that we're going to be um, formulating certain working groups to help us through this process because this is going to take a lot. But we believe that at the end of it is really going to help us get a sense. What was the purpose of today? We wanted to kind of get a sense of the, the thinking of our stakeholders. And uh, more importantly, we want to buy in. We believe that this program, we believe that WIS is raised up to train people for ministry. And in changing times, we believe that mission continues. And we must be hearing from you and we must be responding in a way that brings glory to God. Um, so that is the answer to the question as well as it would have spoken to a number of things. Um, where do we go from here? We'll be keeping you um, abreast on the journey. We'll be reaching out to you if you want to make specific comments, as was invited. Please share with us, all right? We've, we've been having our president sitting very patiently, taking it in, and uh, he is the one who is the captain of the ship at this time, and who has to be the one who's going to be leading the school as we go through this time of program review. And so... We are thankful for his commitment, and um, may the Lord bless you. We want to say thanks to uh, QREP uh, for letting us use their facilities, uh, the, the Song Tech, and everyone who would have been here and helping us. Thanks to our tech person. Thanks to uh, Sister Karen, and um, these are employees of WIS, Sister Galan, who's been here helping us coordinate everything. And um, may the Lord richly bless you. I want to invite our president to come at this time and give his brief closing remarks and to dismiss us um, in prayer. And thanks on behalf of the academic arm of the school, on behalf of the steering committee, and on behalf of the faculty lecturers of WIS, we want to thank you for your contribution. Thank you so much, Andrea, for doing such a wonderful and effective job in piloting this part of the journey. God bless you, Dr. Ferret. Indeed, we want to thank our board of directors, okay, who we are accountable to, and we have some members of them, okay, I think uh, George, Reverend George, Dr. George Frederick, okay, we have had um, our chair, um, Sister Andrea Phillips in, um, in Grenada, yes, we, we thank you all for being a part of this entire um, process. If there are any other, uh, you know, I may have missed my, my apologies in terms of that. Uh, the general administrator, I was informed that uh, he is there with us, the Right Honorable Reverend Dr. Uh, Nolan Warner. Yes, okay. So we thank all of you. Um, from where, where I sit is that uh, this is a journey and that uh, I want to thank, you know, all of the key officers of, um, of WIS. We have to respond, ladies and gentlemen. We have to respond. Uh, we are faced with, um, you know, with certain um, challenges uh, that are environmental uh, in nature. And so that as a school, we, you know, we cannot remain how we 
uh, how we were or how we are, but it's really to get the right balance. Yes, I listen carefully. And one of the things, um, um, Robert Harper and um, Lady Andrea, one of the things that's really hit me hard, okay, is when somebody talk about the tension right, between the young ministers, okay, or the youth and the aging population. Right? And that, um, that is a tension. That's the reality. And somehow we have to play a role in terms of, of how do we address um, the, 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 the two polar ends, uh, as, um, as it were. So we thank you tonight, and we want to look to the Lord in prayer. We, there would be other um, sessions, and that uh, we look forward. Uh, we look forward to that. Get your, your, your submissions in, okay? Get your submissions in. You know, you have questions, you have contributions, etc. Okay, they can be, you can send them through the, uh, the names that we had um, up there, the VP for Academic Affairs, okay? The uh, Reverend Harper, okay? The Quality Assurance Person, Andrea, uh, Quality Assurance Officer, Andrea Brasnell, Yes, so now um, you can send to um, Lady Galen, okay, Lady Galen, uh, Joseph Kerr, okay, or if you want to send um, to me, no, oh, you can send it to me, okay, in terms you know, of um, the president, yeah, and um, we will put it all together. We are a team, yes, and we are now we have the responsibility in terms of charting that course going, um, going, going, going forward. There's a lot to be done, and so we'll continue to call upon you. There are some of you who would be able and would be willing and competent to support us in, at, at the school in doing different aspects, you know, of not only this um, process, but there are other um, features of the, um, of the, in the life of the school. And so we want to encourage you, connect with us, okay? Pick with, yes, pick with. I right, participate, get involved, um, connect, yes, and apart from participate, pray for us, pick with, yes, pray and offer us, invest in us, communicate with us. Father and God, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, God, we thank you for this venerable institution called the West Indies School of Theology. For God, many have gone on before, and it's a not only upon their shoulders, but their blood, sweat, and tears. And our early missionaries, like Charles Barker and Jameson and Eames and others, oh God, that um, they saw the vision, they felt a call. Oh God, they sent your presence. And because of the, of the work was advancing in the Caribbean, uh, that it became necessary for, for Charles Barker um, to, 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 to communicate with, uh, with, 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 with Jameson. Oh, God, then what uh, regional superintendent and liaison with Canada that we need, okay, to train our people because men and women are getting saved. Yes, and ministry is developing. And so, God, we thank you for the efforts of those that have gone that went on before. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Father, we thank you for our immediate past president, Reverend Dr. Pat Glasgow. God, touch him right now. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Oh God, we thank you. Oh God, for Reverend Dr. Pearl Rivers, our past chair of the board. Oh God, all of these have made um, sterling contributions uh, for the continuing development of the institution. Oh God, there are students uh, who, former students, who continue to sub commit, amen, and support this school. Oh God, our workers, our pastors, our bishops, God, we thank you. We thank you for them. And so the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord causes face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant unto you his peace. Until another time, on behalf of the West Indies School of Theology, we do thank you and we appreciate you. Until then, have a restful night in the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you again.